As a sculptor, I use other bodies to make a self-portrait. I transplanted many times my emotion or my thoughts in the face of someone else. It is the case of this sculpture, for example, with the mouth open, which is one of the portraits I have done that is paradoxically one of the most accurate self-portraits, even though it is not me that you see. In the case of this statue, I was in a moment in my life where I was convinced that a new form of sacred was possible. I had this intuition that the sacred could live outside the religions, in a secular form. I was in Florence at the time for two months, and I was walking the streets of Florence overwhelmed by the thoughts of sacred secularism. So these thoughts became me, it became the self entirely. From morning to evening, myself was that vision. It became so present that I decided to represent myself, or the self, in the influence of a hieratic vision. The first inspiration that came to my mind, of course, was Zubaran. I recognized what I was feeling through his monk paintings. But my vision of the hieratic self was different, because it wasn't religious. It was the possibility of the sacred in the godless man that was the essence of the self-portrait. So I called one of my favorite models, and in a dark studio south of Palazzo Pitti, I started the work. I asked the model to sit on the chair, and I asked him just to sit the mouth open for two weeks, which he did gracefully. So people would enter in the studio and would be rather surprised to see a man the eyes closed and the mouth open sitting silently. So that was myself sitting in front of me. Me looking at me. I could start the self-portrait. But something was missing though. His jaw was open but nothing in his face was animated of sacrality. That is where I started the poetical surgery. It is a rather interesting experience that I record with joy. As I was looking at his mouth, that is where all the emotions are in this piece, I started to analyze how the presence of the sacred was acting on the anatomy of my own face. Doing this physical or metaphysical exercise, I realized that each thought in our brain is activating tendons and muscles. So I was feeling my thoughts activating the muscles and the tendons above the mouth asymmetrically so. I was concentrating to see how my philosophy was affecting my body without looking at my face in a mirror but just by feeling the connection between the muscles of my face in some sort of metaphysical state. So I could transfer the self into the face of my model. So yes, this is not me but it is very much a self-portrait. In the 19th century, there was a strange and interesting man called Duchesne de Boulogne. He was an electrophysicist. He hired a poor fellow to which he was attaching electrical poles to all of the muscle of the face to try to understand what emotion triggered what muscle. I think of philosophy as these electrical poles. The more we explore philosophical regions, the more we are able to expand the expressions of our self-portrait.
I never think about sculpture. I wouldn't be a serious sculptor if I were thinking often about sculpture. I always thought that sculpture was some sort of um, three-dimensional anthropology. The only thing that I concern myself with is the question of the essence of man. I am dealing as a sculptor with the human form. If I sculpt man, I have to know more about what man is. If I were to stop having something to say about the essence of man, I would stop sculpting immediately and wait maybe years until I can speak about man again or never sculpt again. Like a philosopher, you are carving the essence of man. The self-portrait that shows the civilization behind the cedar is for me the highest form of self-portrait, because it shows the essence of man in time, and the essence of man is always temporal, each century comes up with a new riddle to solve. What we call the self is the result of the self-development of a civilization. So what is human is different according to what segment of history the artist is born in. The strength of a sculptor is not to represent reality well. The strength of a sculptor is to represent the moment of reality he lives in. When I look at Rodin's work, what I see is not human bodies. What I see is 19 centuries of Christianity crashing in the beginning of the age of atheism. And that moves me, because he was able to do a portrait of his epoch through his sculpture. Rodin said, an artist is a musical instrument where the civilization plays its notes. Therefore, an artist can call himself a realist only when he discovers the moments of self-development of humanity to which he is a witness. The problem in the 21st century, we do not have a clear picture of the civilization we live in. If I don't know what reality is, how can I be a realist sculptor? Michelangelo and Zurbaran had Christianism. The sculptors of ancient Egypt had the Book of the Dead. What do we have? Today, for the first time in history, the artist has to define by himself the civilization he lives in. This effort is a monstrosity for one man only, and that is why art has become almost impossible today. So I am forced, if I want to stay an artist, to ask myself who we are and what we are now. What is my civilization? My only chance to create is to decipher my century. If I want to be a sculptor of the self, I have no other choice than to become an archaeologist of the present and unearth our collective identity. I have to place myself in the future of a man who holds in his hand a statue made in the third millennium and whispers, Oh, this is who they were. As I carve this statue, carving the self, I have to stitch the centuries together, because I know there is a thread of art. And broken, we have to find it. That is where the real contemporary lies in the reality of ourselves in time. Feuerbach asks, what does remain of a civilization? He answers, paper and stone. So I will let the statue speak. If we can look at the marble and hear its thoughts at the same time, then we might have a complete self-portrait. Maybe the statue can tell us in what moment of humanity it has been created. What interests me is the philosophical DNA of a statue. Statue, please do speak. What am I? It is more likely that nothingness has created what is than somebody. Another word for nothingness is the nothing, as defined in Latin by the nihil. Nihilism is the affirmation of the nothing. If nothingness has created what is, then nothingness is the highest principle of reality. It is safe to say that if nothingness created us, nothingness is a sacred entity. It is therefore safe to say that the closer man gets to nothingness, the more he becomes sacred. By becoming one with his origin, he increases his sacrality and eventually becomes one with transcendence. If nothingness is the origin of man, it is by becoming nobody that someone becomes sacred. Nobody is the corporeal expression of the nothing. The death of God has opened the age of atheism. Three concepts 
are forever going to matter in the understanding of man, and that is atheism, nihilism, and atheology. Atheism is saying that God doesn't exist, and nihilism is saying that if God doesn't exist, life has no meaning. Atheology is the science of the negation of God. In the science, the sacred nihilism rises. Nihilism says life has no meaning, but sacred nihilism says if life has no meaning, you are closer to nothingness that is the source of the sacred. The negation of God is placing man closer than ever to his creator that is nothingness, the great nihil. If nothingness is the highest state of humanity, the fulcrum of atheism is a religion without God. Only the negation of the negation is a true affirmation. The affirmation says God exists, the negation says God doesn't exist, the negation of God is a moment in the process of the sacred, the negation of the negation opens the possibility of an atheist God. Sacred nihilism is restoring the sacred through the negation of God, nothingness being the veil of transcendence. We, therefore, with sacred nihilism, welcome a magnificent age, the age of godless transcendence, le néant c'est l'être, le rien est le secret du tout. God is dead, yes, but the God of atheism is alive. This is the case of the self-portrait as a body. I found in Florence uh, the most perfect self-portrait in a shape of a body. I remember I was in an atelier in the evening waiting for a new model, and suddenly this extraordinary model arrives in the studio, and my pencil fell on the floor, I remember. Um, it is like if the deepest thoughts of humanity had a body, it would be him. I felt I was in front of my metaphysical self. The body is the most powerful representation of the mind. All these bones, tendons, ribcage, flesh, fats and tensions, they talk only about man. A nude is a book of philosophy. So earlier we spoke about using another face uh, to do the self-portrait, where the other was merely an object to transfer the self. Here we have a different case. We have another body that has already what you want to say in his anatomy, uh, which is a very rare case. Uh, you have the case of the body as a self-portrait. In many cases, you will, in my opinion, uh, do a much better self-portrait by sculpting the body than by sculpting your face. The body uh, shows much more dramatically and honestly who we are, and the history of our existences than the face. The face shows a lot of time how we want to be seen and hides, hides the self more than giving us a portrait of the self. We want to be perceived in a certain way. When I hired this model, my thoughts were all concentrated on the idea that immanence could be the expression of transcendence that there was no contradiction between the material and the immaterial, and this body was a perfect picture of my mind at this moment of my life, where I had the revelation that there was no contradiction between materialism and religion, and my thoughts were even further. I was intoxicated by the, the idea uh, that maybe even materialism could be its own religion. And this model came in, and I could see written like an invisible scroll on his body. This body allowed me to sculpt this revelation, so I hired him for the transcendental body. To this day, this torso is one of my most faithful self-portrait. This is my self-portrait as an atheologian, finding infinity in nothingness. A portrait of me with me, or a portrait of me through another face, or a portrait of me through a body, offer various readings of the self. But it is still limited to a moment of the self. I think the absolute self-portrait would be the form of a triptych, like in the High Middle Age, 
through the supreme form of Matthias Grunwald, we can offer a picture of the self becoming itself and the different moments of this experience that we call life. So I will end this conversation with an unfinished monumental sculpture triptych, an attempt to solve the dialectic of a life. This triptych is a self-portrait in movement, 20 years of the self gelled in sculpture. Thank you.